Hey everyone, welcome back to the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel, iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you're getting this podcast. This is a very special edition of the Barbell Medicine podcast. This is the med school how do <laughs> podcast. Med- medicine what do. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so because people have asked us uh, over and over and over again, like, how did you train while you were in medical school, residency? How did you study? Like so many questions pertaining to like our actual time spent in medical training. So I figured we would compile a list of all these questions and kind of expound upon them to the best of our ability. Now, this is an interesting uh, – it's interesting for another reason. I have not done any like additional research on this on our podcast topics or this particular podcast topic compared mm-hmm. to what we normally do, or you kind of do some other reading and find some interesting stuff. So uh, I think we'll try to qualify each statement as far as advice goes to the best of our sure. ability. Cause it, some of it could just be two guys talking who happen to have gone through the process, but not necessarily like, you know, the average statistics for matriculation, for instance, like right. this will be, this will be an example of us spouting off uncontrolled observational experience, <laughs> which yes, we, exactly. we don't, we don't often do, but that's what we, yeah, yeah, we know, try to avoid. Pe- that's what people want to know about from us. They don't necessarily, you know, I don't, I don't think that people who are asking us these questions would find it as engaging if we just like, you know, recited research data on like, you know, the, the average, you know, board scores or something like that. It's like that. Anybody can kind of look up, but I think they want to know like the, the human side of it, I guess, going through the process, uh, to get at least where we've gotten so far. Sure. Sure. So, uh, to get us started, I want you to say, hi, my name is your name. And then like the, why, uh, like your, your medical training and then how you ended up wanting to be a doctor. Hi, my name is uh, Austin Baraki. I am an internal medicine physician uh, located in San Antonio, Texas. My schooling consisted of an undergrad degree in uh, chemistry, followed by uh, medical school uh, training at Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk, Virginia, and then uh, proceeded from there to uh, internal medicine residency in San Antonio, Texas. Um, And I'm now teaching faculty at another local uh, academic residency program in town. Uh, as far as why and when I wanted to become a doctor, I kind of tend to tell the story where I think my parents have home video of me from Christmas of like 1991 or 1992, something like that, saying that I wanted to grow up to be a doctor. So somehow that idea got in my head very early, whether rationally or otherwise. Um, and, you know, I think there are a lot of factors that play into one's ultimate decision to pursue something as big as this. There's, you know, the there's to some extent going to be a component of altruism in most people's minds when they go into kind of a healthcare type field. There's also the the challenge of the field really attracted me. Um, the fact that it's something that has a large cerebral component that I can kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's like a never ending learning process and you get to apply this to working with other people is a very uh, rewarding, uh, rewarding type field to go into. Um, and I knew that there was always going to be a job for me. I think that's not an unusual sort of story, but it is interesting that you and I have like sort of disparate path have had disparate paths coming to, you know, roughly a a similar, similar point. So, so you wanted, you knew that you wanted to be a doctor from like a relatively young age. Now, whether that was, (laughs) you know, your dad or whoever saying (laughs) you're going to be a doctor, (laughs) (laughs) you know, and you're like, oh yeah, why do I want to be a doctor when I'm like seven years old? (laughs) Um, I didn't decide that I wanted to be a doctor. I had no, no inkling of being a physician until I was 25 or 26. Like that just didn't even, I wanted to be a mechanical engineer originally, like when I was a kid, like that was the thing I had, and, or like an architect and like everything that I had, you know, all the, the, the free play that I was doing that wasn't involved in like riding my bike or like, you know working in the garage with my dad on engines and stuff was drawing stuff on a drafting board that I had, you know, gotten or or like, you know, messing around with an auto free trial of AutoCAD back when computers, like, you know, you're like putting together. I remember playing with AutoCAD. I I, I assume you were drawing stick figures, squatting and moment arms. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. (laughs) It started early. But, and even, even in high school, like I didn't take any biology or chemistry in high school. I took physics every single semester. And then I took, metallurgy and uh 
uh, this, you had this free, like independent study at ch- in shop where I was I, sand casting stuff or whatever. I was just curious about that. Like I, anyway, I didn't want to be a doctor till like adulthood. So it's interesting that from a very young age, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I also want to be a doctor than I, I didn't, but yeah. So, so my story, my backstory is a little bit different, um, as far as like how and, and, and why, but Yeah. So in high school, I didn't want to be a doctor. College, I ended up getting a biology degree just because I was curious in science, but I wasn't pre-med or pre-anything. I just, I got a biology degree. And because I wasn't pre-med or pre-dental or pre-anything like that, health sciences or whatever, I didn't take, or I I didn't have access to like the biomedical sciences, like the specialty courses. So I was taking those all as like electives sometimes, like human physiology. I had to take regular, like, you know, the the regular physiology course where you're learning about you know whales and horses and stuff like that and you're like right, right. or like anatomy I had to take comparative anatomy before I took human anatomy and then uh, ecology which is very useful <laughs> very useful in, um, <laughs> in medical training but but it's interesting uh, that after I graduated and then I got into the uh, fitness industry and I was coaching for a while the idea was basically I had I. The medical science stuff was super interesting to me. Like that, I was so curious, and I was like, "That would be a really cool thing to learn." Thing one, and then thing two, I'm like, "I want to get more people to train, exercise, whatever." Uh, but no one's going to listen to me, no matter how many certifications that I amass. I mean, I had already had you know six or seven different certifications, and I thought that would made me like a subject matter expert. But my cachet was not what I wanted it to be at the time. Yeah. So I'd considered PT school. I considered, uh, uh, get being, you know, going to chiropractic school. This is all before. I'm just like, Oh, if I have a professional degree, I'm going to be, you sure. know, people are going to listen. And I was like, well, if I'm going to spend all this money and time, I might as well just go to medical school, you know, <laughs> creme de la creme. But, uh, yeah, that, that's, that space that basically happened when I was 24, 25, uh, when I kind of made this decision that I was going to actually go for it. And uh, a lot of it, that, this, that mentor, you know, the spine surgeon story, yeah, but yeah. he was, he was effectively a mentor to me. And he was like, what are you doing? Just coaching people. <laughs> like you have so much more to offer. And I was like, are you my hype man? Like, what are you doing? Man? <laughs> but, <laughs> so anyway, yeah, he, he basically encouraged me to, uh, to get my, my act together and apply. Uh, but I think the biggest reasons why I ended up wanting to become a doctor was the medical science aspect of it. And then the public health sort of deal. Those were, I felt like my two biggest drivers towards actually going through the thing that is medical training. Not like I, it wasn't from a very young age, like, yeah, I'm going to fix people. Yeah, yeah. I, right. <laughs> not to say that that's a bad, I'm not saying that's bad. <laughs> well, I would argue that we don't fix people either. So <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> the first sort of thing, I actually got a lot of questions about how to become a competitive applicant to medical school. And I think this is, you know, for our, per, for the listeners who have no interest in actually going to medical school, I think this is also answered this question describing the process actually gives them some background, like, Hey, medical school, like getting in in the United States is a, a tough, uh, you know, pretty big deal. But again, <laughs> you and I have had very different paths towards getting into medical school. Were you a direct, ex- direct admit from undergrad? Uh, well, so I ended up, um, I guess I can flesh out the background here. So I finished uh, high school and, you know, I was, I was, it, it's easy to say that like, you know, you just worked your ass off and grinded it out and everything like that. And, and you, you know, but I think that I was uh, very fortunate, had a super supportive family and various other like opportunities that not necessarily everybody has that kind of facilitated my path and kind of allowed me to express, I guess, a lot of these, these, these traits and, and, uh, you know, have the time and opportunity to do the work needed to get where I am. So, you know, in high school I had the opportunity to take a bunch of like, you know, the more advanced classes, I guess, that ended up getting me like 30, I can't remember, like over 30 credits going into college. So I was actually trimmed a year of college off. So I, f- I finished my um, undergrad degree in chemistry, did a ton of organic work uh, and finished that in three years. But along the way at the College of William and Mary, they had a joint program with Eastern Virginia Medical School where I was able to basically in like apply, interview, uh, you know, do a few other things very early on in the college career. 
And basically what that would do is get you an interview and if you, without needing to take the MCAT and you could get accepted to start effectively after college would end for you. Um, so I actually got accepted that way. And then because I finished a year early, I had a gap year, like I couldn't matriculate a year early. So I ended up, um, working as a medical scribe at a local ER for a whole year before entering medical school. Um, yeah. So that was kind of my, my path. Right. So that's like the, Hey, I am an academic badass. I'm gonna, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to med, med medical school the least, uh, <laughs> uh, or the most direct way possible. Sure. Uh, on the other hand, <laughs> very interesting parallels here, or not, not parallels, but per- perpendicular. <laughs> paths, yeah, yeah, basically. yeah. Well, we're just very <laughs> divergent, and then we just, yeah. Uh, well, so, so were you in 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 undergrad where you had already kind of decided I want to go to medical school and had taken, you know, these AP courses in high school that counted as credits. I, that was not available to me. Right. At, well, not only with the course loads that I, I was taking, but also just like it was expensive and I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I was like, I mean, I was taking calculus and, you know, this advanced, these advanced physics courses in <sighs> high school, but and I could have theoretically paid for them to be college credit, but I didn't even know, you know. Oh, you mean to go take the tests and stuff? Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. I'm I like, mm, I don't know. Like, is this useful or not? So yeah. I was like, nah, I'll just whatever. I'll just do it in college. <laughs> um, so and then in college, I actually started out as a uh, Bible major I, which, at the at a school <laughs> where that happened. So other schools would be a philosophy major. But yeah, interesting. That was an interesting time. But um after that, I uh, I was a biology, uh, like I said, a biology major, but I did not do well in undergrad. Like, and I think just coming from a Bible school to a state school, like that was where I transferred my sophomore year. And I was like, girls, <laughs> 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 like, you know, like this is, and just, you know, I'm 18 or 19 years old and whatever. I, I didn't know, not only did I not know what I wanted to do, but I didn't know how to study like Sure. I just did, you know, so, so trying to like study for a chemistry course, I was like, I, I don't know. They also, I just want to say, I want to lay some blame here on my, you know, whoever the registrar was at the time. I had, I had taken my first chemistry course at the first school that I went to where Greg Knuckles and I actually went to school. <laughs> we didn't go to school together because I'm a little bit older than him, but uh, I took like the, in, the, the intro to chemistry, like the chemistry survey course, like Chem 100. Yeah. And, and they counted that as Gen Chem 1 for me, which is not the same thing. So they thought they were doing me a favor. And then my first semester at the, at state, at the state school was Gen Chem two. Uh, you just got wrecked. <laughs> I, I got a C in a five, five hour course. Yeah. And I'd also taken Calc one again and uh, at the first school that I went to and got an A at it. And they were like, well, you really need a calculus here for this, you know, science major. We're not going to give you credit for that. So you can just take Calc two. So I took Calc. T- yeah. And I got to see in that another five hour course. Right. So already, already my GPA is in the, you know, is in the doldrums. Yeah, exactly. It's not very good. And so the average uh, entry GPA to medical school at the time, like when I applied, so 2011 was when I applied was a 3.6 science GPA and a 31 on the MCAT. I graduated undergrad with a 298 the GPA. Now I did really well my last two years, like literally all A's, but those C's and then I, it was not help. And they're like, yeah, well, what's your science GPA? And I was like lower because <laughs> so. Yeah. I think that, that, that's an important point for people to, to understand is that, you know, the most important thing uh, is, you know, going into med school and even before that going into college or as early as you can possibly figure out how to study or, or what methods of studying work best for you, um, is super, super important. And that's like an example of what I mean as I had the opportunities and the challenges and, and the time to figure that out when I was, you know, by the time I was probably a sophomore in high school or a freshman or sophomore in high school, like I had studying down, I knew, you know, how to do it. I knew how to prepare for everything. And that just like made everything else down the road, you know, easier academically speaking. Yeah. I mean, in high school I, I studied, but then also a lot of my coursework was like independent sort of self-directed learning, which you're not making your own like standardized test sure. out of, you know, what does this finished hammer look like that you made, <laughs> you know, that you cast it. And then, uh, yeah, it, was, it just wasn't the same. And I, and, and then in college, I think I was distracted and ultimately not, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but yeah. So people were like, Oh, did you, did you crush 
college? Like, is that how you got into medical school? I'm like, no, I did not do very well. So if I had to do this all over again, I would have done better in undergrad and had a more competitive GPA because what I had to do in order to make myself a competitive applicant to medical school was go get a master's degree. That's why. So when people ask like, why did you go get a master's degree? I'm like, well, I was living in St. Louis because I had, I was gainfully employed you know, as, uh, doing a lot of things like coaching as a consultant, like, you know, running a business and I couldn't really leave cause I still needed to like make money to support myself. And so I was stuck in St. Louis and the only thing that I could, that I had access to was this, uh, they call it the caps program is at St. Louis university. And you ended up with a master's in clinical anatomy and physiology. And I was like, Oh, it's perfect. Like in my thought initially, I was like, it's perfect. You do the first year effectively with the med students at SLU. Right. And I was like, cool. I'll just, you know, show them what's up, swell up on these folks. And then I'll get into slew. I won't have to move. I can, you know, keep this job. It'll be fine. Um, and I actually did. I mean, yeah, I honored every course uh, at the internet master's program. And uh, that being said, the problem with using that to apply to medical school is that if the medical schools have a hard time, like comparing, like, well, what, how rigorous is this master's course unless it's that school or they have a similar master's program. So like, so if the, if the med schools that you're applying to generally have these post back programs or special master's programs or whatever, then generally they know like, oh, this is a rigorous, we expect that this is a rigorous thing, especially if they've had other students come from that program. But if they don't, then they don't know how to compare that. Whereas a, a undergrad GPA is more standardized. So a lot of places won't actually take uh, into consideration your master's GPA uh, unless they have that program. So if I had to do that over again, because when I applied, you didn't even have to apply to medical school. Correct. <laughs> I have, I applied to, I think 25 schools, allopathic schools and like five DO schools. Um, and I got, all interviews at all the DO schools, which I ended up turning down after I got into one of the schools in Kansas City, KCUMB, which is a pretty good DO school. And then um, I only got interviews at two allopathic schools. One was e EVMS, obviously, because that's where I ended up going. And the other one was at SLU, which was three days before the interview season was officially over. And just, just, just so people know, like if you get interviewed late in the season, you're almost assuredly interviewing for an alternate spot or it's a joke interview. And I mean, it was interesting though, because I had literally honored every course with the med students. And then the year after I actually did my coursework, I was uh, writing my thesis. I was teaching them anatomy, not only the med students, but the PA students. And then the med students at Washington University School of Medicine, I was TA in their lab as well, their anatomy lab and also doing some neuroanatomy teaching. And I was like, you guys know that I'm academic, like I will succeed academically, but maybe you just don't want me here because I got my master. <laughs> like, well, they actually said that they wanted more diversity sure, at yeah. their at their institution, which I assumed meant that uh, I wasn't going to get in. <laughs> so, yeah, my I actually got accepted to EVMS on my birthday because I was waitlisted at first. So I was signed, sealed, delivered to KCMB. I'd given them three thousand dollars for like to hold my spot, and then uh, I I we were out for my birthday, and I came home, and I see this huge like envelope in my, in my mailbox. And I was like, what the heck is this, man? And I open it up and it's even, Hey, we wanted to, you know, congratulate you. We're accepting you to the class of 2016. And I was like, on my, on my birthday. Nice. Oh man. And oh, by the way, you have to leave. Yeah. You have to leave in six weeks to like, you know, go move to Virginia. So yeah, we had, you and I had different routes, but but going back, like if you hadn't have done so well academically in undergrad, that direct admit thing would not have been possible you had to maintain what like a three five or three seven five or yeah, something like yeah, that I had to maintain maintain something around that and i was well above that and i think that kind of is the point that part of this podcast is gonna is we're gonna have to lay some of this stuff out there but i think the point that people need to get is you know there are a handful of like big uh big pillars so to speak for medical school admissions and then for residency admissions and basically there are some that arguably matter more than others and so that's where you should probably focus most of your energy and to the extent that you don't you know, uh, achieve as much as you possibly can there, you're going to have to supplement with other things. So, you know, yeah. if you, if you have a killer GPA, 
if you have good letters and if you interview well, I would say those are probably like the, the biggest three things that, that I could suggest somebody to have um, to, to get into medical school. If your grades, you know, in college slip, but you just annihilate your MCAT, then that can make up for it, you know, probably. And you can end up getting it anyway. Or if you have, you know, m- mediocre grades in a mediocre MCAT, then you're probably going to have to go and do some research to, to, to make up for that. I, for example, had no research at all in going into medical school. And furthermore, I did no research in medical school going into residency either for the same exact reasons that I didn't need it based on my academic performance, based on my letters, uh, you know, exam scores and interview. Um, So those are kind of like this is where you focus your energy. But if you for whatever reason, whether within your control or not within your control, you know, those things don't get like optimized, so to speak, or get it do it, you know, as high as you possibly can. That's when you have to start looking at, oh, I need to do shadowing. Oh, I need to do research. Oh, I need to, you know, get some more life experience or work in the field or really, you know, you have to prove your worth in other ways. Um, and And that's unfortunately just the way it is, is that, you know, I don't think that selecting for undergraduate GPA predicts who's going to be a better or worse doctor in the long run, necessarily. I think obviously you have to have a certain level of, you know, cognitive abilities to, to, you know, do what you need to do cognitively in the job in the future. But, you know, can I confidently say that somebody who has a three, eight in undergrad versus somebody who has a three, five versus somebody who has a three, three is going to be, you know, a better or worse doctor in the long run after they go through the whole process. I don't really think so, but that's the way the game is right now. And you kind of have to play the game. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that the entry GPA and MCAT, there's some algorithm that predicts whether or not someone will successfully pass step one which like but to the extent that that's a flaw step one scores themselves i don't think necessarily predict, oh, correlate you know physician yeah. ability either but again it's the way the game is and you got to play the game <laughs> you got to play the test yeah so i think that's a good way to frame it that you know if there are three main pillars it's going to be gpa mcat and your interview skills because again once you get letters inter- I, would, I would put great i would put, oh, yeah. I would put your grades and your mcat kind of like together as like sure. a, academic you know, pure knowledge yeah. test taking ability is really what goes into those sure. things and then interviewing to show that you're not a you know a sociopath and then uh you know um uh, your letters well, for other people to agree that you're not a sociopath <laughs> yeah letters and and i think the also the other thing that like letters of recommendation offer because you know it's not like you're going to get this one amazing letter from a physician or from a family friend. It's just going to wow. People are like, wow, I'm just going to overlook your terrible GPA at MCAT because of this letter. (laughs) Unless it's from somebody who's like a donor at the school of like, you know, has a building named after them, in which case, well, you don't need us. Yeah. You can stop listening right now. <laughs> just you have move. the hand signed letter by by L D Britt from EVMS Ooh. going into general <laughs> surgery somewhere. <laughs> They're going to take you. Yeah, at EVMS. Yeah. Right. Uh, so um, no, I, I think I think that it's just another tick a tick box. Like oh, you have letters that again agree that you're not a sociopath. <laughs> like cool. Uh, you interviewed well. Cool. Move down the list. If you're if you have average academic scores. It, though it's going to be difficult to uh, overcome those without, you know, some something extra. And that might be research. Uh, there might be your ability to talk about your experience in the medical field already, which is where shadowing comes into play. So I would advise people who want to go to medicine, like you should do some shadowing, you know, if not, if not only to like bone up your CV, but also to figure out like, why do you, do you want to be a doctor? And like, if so, why? And so I would, I'm not saying, um, that you should never do any like, uh, like surgical specialty shadowing, but you should do some primary care shadowing just to not only be able to talk about that in your interview, because, uh, interviewers are going to definitely ask you about that. Uh, but also t- so you get, a a better handle on what, you know, medicine would be like if you couldn't do this one specialty. So, I, I mean, I, my first experience shadowing was oral Mac, uh, OMFS. So the, you know, facial, oral surgery. facial surgeons. Yeah. Yeah. And then I did spine surgery and I was like, oh, dude, it's so cool. You know, but it's like if if I tried to if somebody came to me and said, I want to be a spine surgeon and they hadn't yet got into medical school. I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> this is a very competitive, very like long, arduous route. Like I, you need to be OK with not necessarily doing that. And I think you should have some sort of primary care shadowing experience, whether it's family medicine, pediatrics in like you know, uh, even OB, like honestly, any one of those three, like in the clinic would give you something good to talk about in your interview, in your personal statement about primary care. And, and, you know, again, that's playing the game. Even if you have no desire at out on the outset to do those things, being able to talk about it is going to endear you to the interviewers. Like, well, this person actually wants to be a doctor 
and, you know, and they have, they have an idea of what is involved in the field. I mean, I have students, you know, that come and rotate with me on the inpatient service at our hospital and even up to third year medical students who are like a year away from graduating pretty much, you know, for the first half to two thirds of their third year. Um, I put essentially no stock in what they tell me their field, their specialty of interest is. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I don't It'll think change. it is particularly meaningful because so many people end up changing their mind. I, I mean, almost everybody I know, um, almost everybody I know has changed their mind about what specialty they wanted to do over the course of their third year of medical school or even as late as going into their early fourth year. And so I don't really think that it's wise to commit yourself, either truthfully commit yourself or just like say that you really want to do a particular field. You can say something's interesting to you, but you know, that is pretty much meaningless to, to anyone who's actually already out in practice. You know, even if you have some very like emotionally resonant family history experience, like, you know, my relative had cancer and that makes me want to be an oncologist. It's like, you know, that's, we've, we've heard a lot of those stories. And while you may actually end up going through the whole process to become an oncologist, the odds are that you probably won't and you'll change your mind and do something else, which is fine. Um, so yeah, staying, staying, staying open, keeping, keeping more of your opportunities open earlier is, is a good idea. And that's really the same thing that you're doing by, you know, working hard academically, getting high grades. You're just keeping more doors open to you in terms of the number of schools that might be willing to interview you, right? As your, as your, as your grades drop down, you know, more doors close to you in terms of, of interviews, for example, or as other components of the application get worse, more do doors only close to you uh, from that standpoint. So keeping as many of them open as possible is uh, is helpful at every step of the process. Yeah, I mean, you actually bring up a, a, a really interesting point, you know, so if your grades are sliding down or you've already graduated and you're going to try to do this like post hoc, like go back, <laughs> do something different. Um, I don't know that I would rec actually recommend the master's route or the special master's program or a post back unless it has a really good connection to that medical school. Like in so far as like you and you get in, if you do well, like you're guaranteed a spot, even guaranteed an interview is not a big enough thing that for me to say that you should part with all that cash because, you know, you're looking forty fifty thousand $50,000 to do that. I mean, that's, I know before, Georgetown is before medical school. Yeah. It, yeah. I, before med a, a good question to ask in the interview would be something like, you know, what proportion of your students actually go on to get in or get in at this yeah. institution or whatever the case is, that'd be a good screening question. Yeah. So like when I entered into that caps program, it was the first year. They had, so no, you had no data to go off. <laughs> but yeah, I had no data, but I didn't even know to ask that question. Right, this right. is all like, uh, yeah. So I was like, oh, it's cool, man. I'll just go to San Luis, you know, <laughs> School of Medicine. I don't even know what a billiken is. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, so I probably wouldn't recommend routinely doing a master's or post back unless it's got a really high acceptance rate. And I actually think nationwide that that rate is going, it's going down. There are more schools offering these programs, but less of them are actually accepting the students that go through their program. I think it's just because the the programs are growing and so there's less. And there there's you know, opportunities for the schools to make more money probably. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they're not necessarily expanding their med school class sizes that much. But uh, so if I had to do it over again, I would have just taken undergrad courses and just like, I could have taken the same money in the same amount of time and taken 15 hours per semester or whatever and really you know, bumped up my undergrad GPA and that would have made me a more competitive applicant to other schools, which would have kept opened more doors. But yes, to finalize your point, doing well in school, having that big, that nice academic pillar solidified really does help you keep doors open. Uh, and I'm still, as, as far as I know, I have the lowest GPA of any uh, <laughs> non-underserved <laughs> um, population to get into medical school, an allopathic uh, school. So just uh, really, really, <laughs> really one. holding it down. Number one, number one. Well, it's funny. My, my buddy Dickie, he's a ortho resident now at uh, in Chicago. He had a GPA that was like 0. 0.1 higher than mine. So he was like 2.99 and I was like 2.89. And then we both got the same score on the MCAT. So you never took the MCAT, but him and I both got a 31 on the MCAT. And he ended up, we're both from St. Louis. So we were like, oh, we're going to stay here. It's going to be great. Right, right. He didn't even get interviewed, <laughs> you know, which we thought was tough was crowd over a, there in St. Louis. It sounds like, dude. Yeah. It's like, come on guys. You're not, <laughs> you're confusing yourself with wash you. Yeah. Um, so he ended up in, uh, uh, Marshall West in West Virginia. Yeah. And then I ended up in Eastern Virginia. We're like, I don't know how we both ended up in Virginia, but okay. Weird, weird flex, Slew, but okay. The last thing uh, we briefly uh, mentioned it was interviews, like how to prep, prepare for an interview or, um, so I, I think this is interesting. Like 
I think every every undergrad that I you know have been in contact with or people in undergrad uh, programs that I've been in contact with, there's usually some sort of mock interview like they'll set up. I, I would recommend them. I never did that because I decided to like go back to school after uh after this so and i was a little bit older and i felt really comfortable going into the interviews so if, i think if you could do mock interviews that's useful the only other thing uh and at university of washington washington state uh, are, uh has all these ethics questions on their website like there's like sample ethics questions you might be given in an interview and then the actual answers so not only is it an introduction to like medical ethics but also because what if you're asked one of those like during an interview and you're like Buh. I mean, those are those are those are both things that that I did. Uh, I think I would recommend doing a mock interview as well. And then, yeah, for those kind of like just random, spontaneous interview questions, I think our audience knows how well I do with that kind of thing. Just like <laughs> pulling shit out of my brain on the fly. Um, and so, you know, you have to you have to do that so you don't, you know, crack. <laughs> at, at, e, at EVMS, they actually asked me. They were like, "Well, so let's say that you're uh, a, you're a surgeon and you accidentally nicked." uh an artery supplying the liver during a gallbladder removal and the patient uh didn't have any complications um would you tell the family when you gave them the post-op report and before reading any of the like that was an exact question or very similar question to something that was on the university of washington website so i already knew the answer like of course you tell them and then you you know assure them that the patient's gonna be fine however you're considering all uh you're watching for all potential complications uh, but if I wouldn't have read that before, I'd be like, no. <laughs> Got a stupid question I mean, that. <laughs> yeah, that was stupid. <laughs> Is the tree falls in the wood? Yeah. And no one's there to make a sound? That's like, funny. Yeah, so uh, that would have been, you know, the interview would have actually blown up at that point. So I'm glad that I, I'm glad that I read that. Uh, t- did you only interview at EVMS? You only uh, did one interview. Correct. I only or did you not even interview? No, no. So I, I interviewed, it's kind of funny. I interviewed at... Uh, one college i interviewed at one medical school i interviewed at i interviewed for th- three residency programs and then uh and then just one job after residency <laughs> so, so pretty you know that's that's again like keeping doors open and and uh it's it's a good strategy if you can i see that, i see that now you're peaking you've decreased your volume <laughs> right. and now you've peaked <laughs> so did they ask you any weird questions during your resident or your uh any interview i actually remember nothing about my interview from there other than i was like sweating a lot going into it um so i was glad that i had like a blazer on but that was all I, that's all i remember <laughs> you're not a sweaty guy i'm not no. yeah yeah no, awesome. but, i mean you know that was my first and only medical school interview. And I was like, Hey, I, I want to go here. So, uh, but I don't remember, I don't remember my interview experience really at all there. Um, to be e- honest, EVMS didn't ask me any weird questions, but KCUMB and, uh, SLU, they both talked, asked me about lifting the one, uh, uh Larry, uh, Wilmore, Dr. Wilmore was like the program director. I had my interview with him at SLU and he goes, uh, he goes, so what's your best bench press? And I told them. And then he goes, what's your favorite lift? I told him the deadlift. And he goes, oh, is that the one where you put the bar on your back? And you, and I was like, no, nah, man. That's just, <laughs> they should have had that. Like, ethically, do I correct him or do I just go? Yeah, yeah right, right. totally. So, yeah. And then it, every residency interview, they always ask me what I bench pressed. So, yeah. And that was even during my CrossFit phase. Like, I wasn't even like you know, swole during that, the, they just, let me be like by comparison, by comparison, but yeah, that was funny. We'll talk about how to do well in medical school. This is like the, how do you study (laughs) question? So again, we kind of went over this. You had much better grades coming in from undergrad uh, than I did. I learned to study in, uh, during my master's program, what uh, strategies did you like learn early on or, or did you learn ultimately that that helped you through medical school? Like, did you have a set way to study that really kind of. Yeah. Um, so I think that the strategy that I used evolved a little bit over the years. So I basically in high school and through college, the strategy was uh, consisted of taking the material condensing it as much as I can into like the most important topics and then re- uh, repetition over that condensed material. So I tried to trim away the fluff, get the important stuff, condense it down onto, you know, not like 150 slides or like onto a sheet of paper or two or something like that, and then repeatedly go over it. 
And then, um, are you physically of, writing this stuff down or like typing at that it? stage? At that stage, I was, I would like oh, rewrite okay. stuff in a condensed form, basically. Yeah. And then, uh, and then trying to think like a test writer, um, trying yeah, yeah. to anticipate questions. How could I be asked about this? What, what could they ask about this or how could they connect these two topics or, you know, second order questions, et cetera, things like that. Um, and so that was basically what I used through high school and through college, um, the entire time. Med school started out doing that early on, and then uh, a couple months into medical school, realized that there was way too much material to actually go through and and like rewrite in a condensed form. Uh, it was just the vol- the volume of material material quadrupled from college to you know first year medical school. It was like pretty huge. Um, and so I realized that that was not necessarily a practical strategy. Um, there are a number of, so, so basically the, the two things to, that medical students have to think about early on is that you are wanting to get, you know, perform well in your classes. Um, and you're also working towards the ominous, uh, step one board exam at the end of your, you know, second year of, of, uh, of training. And, Sometimes, particularly when you have older faculty teaching your courses, they can design the classes however they want, and it may not necessarily be as reflective of the step one exam. And so that presents a dilemma for students because they want to perform well on this board exam, but their teachers are asking them about their like pet research topics or something else that can be annoying for people. Um, but you don't, again, you have to play the games the way it is. So you have to do well in the classes, you have to do well on the board exam. Um, and so, you know, I found that the main, the, 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 the con- rather than condensing the material myself, I would end up using, uh, there, there's like, you know, certain, um, you know, very commonly used review texts and things like that. So the, the first aid book is the name of it that every medical student will already have heard of. That's an example of a text that takes all this content and condenses it down already. So that, so that saved me the step of having to rewrite all this stuff was basically it's pre-condensed. Yeah. Go you ahead. know, I never actually, I never actually bought. I never owned a first aid. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like the only student in history. (laughs) That was probably the most heavily used text that I had going into the, the step one exam. So I think that using that pre-condensed material and then repetition of what was in there and repetition of the course material, because I knew that I had to do well in the classes. So, you know, repetition over the most important topics and the slides, like they would say they would send out the slides to the students and I would, you know, highlight or bold or change the color of what I thought was important stuff. And then when I'm flipped through the slides and repetition, I think to myself, how can they ask me about this? What kind of questions can I anticipate? on this topic. And then to the extent that there are practice questions available to you, whether they're provided by your school or whether you're going to do one of like the question bank type things, I actually used those um, throughout the first two years of school to use as like practice question sources um, in order to prepare for both classes, to learn the the question style of the board exam and ultimately to prepare for the board exam itself. So I think Condensing it into a practical amount of material, repetition. I mean, I think that every test I went into for class, the material for it, I probably had reviewed somewhere between five and seven times through, um, accelerating each time, right? So by the end, it's a pretty quick run through because it should be in your brain and then doing practice questions. That was like the strategy that I used um, for medical school. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that I had a similar my a similar sort of realization uh probably during the end of my undergrad and then that was solidified for me um during my master's program where it was like space repetition learning for me like to repeat the material that was king and so in undergrad at that point anki wasn't a thing so i was literally making either flashcards or like some sort of like material, like even a PowerPoint or like whatever that would just get shorter and shorter until the end, it would be like maybe 20 like keywords that I would like be able to expand upon eloquently, you know, to like really reflect this, the test material. But then in, uh, during my master's program, um, again, there was no like bank already (laughs) uh, that we had access to. So again, I was making flashcards or similar stuff. But then when he got to medical school, There's there was numerous there, question banks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like I remember getting and, and even this goes back even to preparation for the MCAT. People were like, how do you study for the MCAT? You know, it's like, well, at some level, you have to have taken all the source material at some point in your life. There are review any number one, any of the review like texts are fine. Like they're all whatever. It's just a different flavor, a different spice on the same, you know, base dish. The biggest thing thing I would say outside of pick a, you know, pick a review thing and do it, uh, uh, is practice tests. And that speaks to like, 
you are thinking about what questions could they ask. Taking practic- practice exams or sample items gives you ex- gives you examples of those things. So if you can't like come up with, oh, what would they ask me about? You're like, well, now you're looking at it. So it's like I took a you know a handful of practice MCATs, um, and then the same thing when I got into medical school, I would do this sort of spaced repetition learning. I used uh, at the time it was called gunner training, but then they switched it to rebranded to firecracker, which is effectively like pre-made high yield items that you get to like, you know, review on your computer and say, oh, I know this really well. And if you know it really well, you won't see it for like 30 days, 90 days or whatever. And if you don't know it at all, you'll see it again tomorrow. So it spaces the rep that, that out for you. Uh, but then when it came time for uh, like a test in medical school, I would just focus only on that that te- like if it's pathology, I would only focus on the pathology of the organ systems that we were, you know, looking at. And then if it was a, a subject like histology, you'd have like a, a test where you're, you're going to go look under a bunch of microscopes and identify tissues and pathology and tissues. Then you're trying to find sample items where you have to recognize patterns. Like, again, you, it's a specific training, right? Yes, you're just, exactly. <laughs> you start very general and then you repeated bout effect and then uh, you specialize uh, as you need to peak. And for step, all I did was the uh, QBank. I didn't do, and and I didn't, everybody's comes up with these like really like extensive study plans or whatever. Like I'm gonna spend all this time prepping for step. And I, I think to the extent that maybe you didn't do as well during med school that we did, then maybe that's necessary. I can't speak to that. I don't have data, you know, on that. What, but I think that you were previously exposed to and sufficiently passed all of the relevant source material. Otherwise, you would not be eligible to take step one. So then the what you would need to do, uh, in my opinion, then is just take pr- practice questions, especially with a, uh, a, a resource like QBank, because you're, it's asking you a question and giving you the the explanation. Yeah. yeah. It's like learning yeah. on the fly. I would, I would agree. I mean, I think that lots of people, particularly around our years, there started to be more like, um, you know, not necessarily the, I don't really recommend people go to the in-person review courses for like a weekend or something. I don't think that can really do very much for people. Yeah. But unless you're not going to do this stuff, unless you're not going to do the work and that's the only way that you will like show up. In <laughs> which case, case we have bigger problems. have gotten into medical yeah. school. But, yeah, yeah. Um, but there was also a bunch of like, you know, courses that came out at the time that were, you know, these very long long like lecture series is like what's it called doctors in training i think was like this oh, yeah. whole long i didn't do any of those series of video lectures that like you know i felt like i was the only person in my class who didn't buy that and and uh, and do it i don't think i Same. was but it felt that way um, but i think that's a probably you know a waste of time for most people compared to doing more questions um I actually was talking to another uh, trainee that I've worked with who was taking a, a, a board exam for a different field entirely, and uh, he had not passed his board exam, and he was very frustrated with this, understandably so. And when I asked him how he prepared, he said he went to a review course, and at the review course, they said, you know, you shouldn't really spend much time doing practice questions un- until you have the, you know, all the base foundational material, you know, have a good understanding of it. And he kind of took that to, to mean that he probably shouldn't spend much time doing practice questions and should review the material more like his review book and the lectures and stuff and ended up not passing. I said, that's your, probably your you know biggest mistake there is doing not doing enough questions because not only do you get specific practice for the skill that you're going to be tested on taking sure. test questions, um, but you also, you know, along the way, if you get something wrong, sometimes you'll start to, you know, see a pattern of like a specific topic that you just like generally, you know, are not very strong on or a topic that you miss repeatedly. Um, I remember in step one training or preparing for that test, like questions on amyloidosis and questions on recognizing multiple myeloma, I was like terrible at back then. Yeah. And I got enough questions wrong that I was like, I'm never going to miss this thing again if it comes, if I have any suspicion of it and a question again. And so you learn how they trick you. You learn how you miss things, which is really important. And so I told him that I estimated that leading up to the step one exam, I estimated that I did probably a vague estimate would be 10,000 practice questions before that, before that. Oh, 10,000 questions to mastery. Yeah. (laughs) So, but I did no review courses um, during, during, during medical school, like along with the pathology course, I think that pathoma thing is actually very, very probably the best thing you can do. But outside of that, no like wholesale review courses would I do or recommend if you were passing your, your med school classes. 
Yeah, I agree. That's the same thing for the MCAT. I probably wouldn't recommend any of the review courses. I'd recommend some doing, like doing more questions. Yeah, exactly. And it only use a text if you need to like review the source material. Yeah. But yeah, same thing. And so just for everybody knows, this is not us flexing, but people are going to want to know, look, how did you do in medical school, actually? So did you honor every course? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, two courses I didn't honor out of the all the preclinical years, but uh, I I honored everything else. So one was the behavioral science course where there was literally two tests. It was like child psychiatry. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, And the other one was immunology. Like literally, yeah, where two people honored. I mean, whatever. I had done done immunology in in undergrad, so that was helpful for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So every other course I honored. But and, And you went to class. Yeah, I never I literally never went to class. I went to class. Uh, on anything that was mandatory that was like, going to get me in trouble because I didn't want to like deal with that. But otherwise, I didn't go to any class. I went to the labs if, as long as they were mandatory. Otherwise, I just found that my time was better spent doing this self-directed study because now I knew how to study. And, you know, I think there's people out there that are going to be listening to this that if their eyes have, have uh, haven't have glazed over by now just listening to all this, you know, me- medical stuff, the, the they'll be saying, you guys are just studying for the test. Like, what about your clinical skill? And my, my argument is that we're figuring out efficient ways to learn this source material so that we don't miss things clinically because ba- effectively if you could recognize them on a test you know like recognize what are the things that i'm not thinking of what are the things that i you know i need to recognize how they're trying to trick me then that helps you apply that later on in the clinic versus yes, sometimes you will recognize the correct answer on a multiple choice question just because you're like, I've never seen any of these other things before. I have no idea. It probably can't be that. And so that's yes, getting lucky and like playing to the test. But but our way of studying the way and and I think there's pretty good data actually on the spaced repetition learning as well. uh, It just it makes you learn that same source material better and more efficiently. I think that when it comes to the clinical stuff, you're going to receive ample clinical training later in your late, later years of medical school. And that's what all of a residency is for. And if you don't learn the stuff earlier on, I mean, you, you will never diagnose that which you don't suspect or think of. Sure. Right. Sure. If, if you cannot make a differential diagnosis, if you never think of the problem, if you don't understand, you know, how acid base physiology works, you're never going to get to the answer of what's going on um, if there is, in fact, something going on. And so I think both pieces of it are important. And as far as, you know, studying, teaching or learning to the test. And once again, you're playing the game. Um, there is data. I think I pasted a picture at the end of our little outline document here where, you know, special residency programs, oh, re- residency yeah. programs were surveyed for the, uh, importance of each factor in a residency application and 90, 94%, the highest proportion of all medical residency programs cited the step one score as, uh, as you know, a, a major determining factor in their decision to accept people into residency, um, which is not the way it should be, I think, but it is the way it is. And so, yeah. you know, if you're a medical student and you are not in a position to change the system, um, uh, that the whole topic of the AAMC and the NBME and all these organizations that are creating these tests and making like mountains of money off of all this stuff, that's like a whole separate conversation that would probably cause more eyes to glaze over. But um, again, if you want to go through this process and come out at the other end, you have to play the game. And so studying, preparing towards the step one test is probably should be the focus of your first year and a half to two years of training because of, again, the higher you do, the more doors remain open as your score drops down, you know, through the 200s down into the low 200s, hopefully not to the sub 200s, more doors close to you. And there are fields that will be completely inaccessible to you no matter what you do. Yeah. Yeah. So the what average passing score for the step one changes uh, like fairly yeah. frequently, but yeah. I think it's in the one nine one nineties. I don't re- right. I don't know what it is now. I barely remember what it was back then. I think it was right around one ninety or so. Yeah, which is yeah. a a very bad score. If yes. you, if you get so the- <laughs> so just to impress upon people at home, like again, if you're not familiar with medical training, like step one when you get into medical school is like one of the best days of your life. You're like all of my hard work is paid off. I've gotten in. Woo! You know, it's great. You know, you celebrate, but then immediately your thoughts or some not, not far after that, your thoughts st- turn to step one performance, because that's like the next hurdle to jump through. Like first it was the MCAT, then it was getting into medical school, then it's step one. And step one has such an important 
uh, it's like the key to your next phase in life. And just like Austin said, there's a number one deciding factor for that residency programs look at, you know, right or wrong. That's what it is. And uh, I, I think say, that's say wrong, but that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because I don't think it adequately predicts like, you know, clinical skill and like, you know, how, uh, but that being said, the it is a very standardized way for them to compare applicants academically. And, you know, so I feel for them. I don't know what the perfect score is. You know, I would propose the gains score. The gain <laughs> score is your one RM to- bench press <laughs> plus your step, your step one score. The bench boards so, index. That's right. <laughs> that's right. So, and, and would you agree like a 240 is like the most commonly cited, like cutoff for what would we would consider top tier residency programs. Uh, yeah. And I think that if you are going to a top tier program and you got something around 240, uh, or if you want to get in, you still have to supplement that with a ton of other stuff. Yeah. So, well, so like 240 is like the sort of cutoff, like if you got below 240 and it's a very competitive, so competitive can be like prestige or like the actual residency itself. So any one of the high paying, you know, specialties become more and more competitive, uh, or it's at a prestigious location like Mass Gen or Johns yeah. Hopkins or anywhere <laughs> right. in California. Those are all what would be considered more c- competitive. They're either competitive geographically or competitive from a reimbursement standpoint of that specialty or both. So like orthopedic surgery at UCLA is like <laughs> super competitive. Yeah. So 240 is like, okay, you haven't been screened out, but 250 is like, ooh, now you're cooking with fire. 260 is like, oh my gosh, how are you so smart? And 270 is actually you... You fall off the other side of the curve because they're like, I don't know, this guy is somewhere on the spectrum. Like he can't, we can't work with him. Uh, so just so now, so people know. But again, that's your like from your day one of medical school, or you know, if day one was a, a you know hungover blur from celebrating getting in, yeah. then day three of medical school, when you come back to your senses, you start thinking about step one. So, without further ado, at home for the, our listeners at home. What was your step one score, Austin, after you've gone, you went to class on a regular basis, you still did the space repetition learning practice questions. How did you do on step one? 265. He got a 265, folks. That's, was it 98th percentile or something like that? Probably. I don't know. The percentile. It's close. Yeah. yeah I mean, 97th or night. Yeah. The, I was, I was happy because again, it kept, I didn't know what I wanted to do yet, obviously only being sec- second year, but it kept all my doors open. Um, I could have. I could have applied to any specialty with that score. Yeah. Uh, and so me, and having never gone to class, uh, still doing space repetition learning, and then also started barbell medicine in uh, right when medical school started, I got a 257. So different, somewhat different, but also somewhat similar approaches. And we both uh, crushed. Uh, do you remember what your favorite class was for medical school? Um, Oh, you mean like the preclinical stuff? I mean, I think I liked several of them. I liked uh, pathophys, the content, not necessarily our our (laughs) feature for it. Um, Neuroscience was very interesting. And microbiology, immunology were probably like the more interesting ones. Uh, You just literally listed every class that we took in the preclinical years. No, I mean, and and pharmacology was was very well taught as well. I mean, I think that least favorite ones, if I had to choose ones that sucked, um, I thought that I really strongly disliked embryology. That one was was uh, um while theoretically kind of like amazing how feed up feti form uh, the content is not particularly engaging um and uh, and for me more interested in adult medicine not particularly relevant for for what i was going to end up doing in the future um histology was pretty uninteresting Although it is where I met Lorraine, so that was neat. Yeah, well, uh, there you go. So that should be your favorite course. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that should probably be your favorite one. Just, you know, if Lorraine ever listens, if she makes it this far. <laughs> I, th- I think my favorite class was anatomy, but it always had been my favorite course. Like I took comparative anatomy in undergrad, human anatomy in undergrad, advanced studies, in, you know, like independent study in human anatomy in undergrad, got my master's in anatomy, taught anatomy and neuroanatomy, and then when I finally took it in med school, just imagine like your seventh pass at a (laughs) very high level through material. You're like, you start learning other stuff, like all the, all the eponyms and all like the weird, like they don't expect you to learn. (laughs) Yeah. The stuff that Galen was talking about, like back in the day, like, I mean, I dissected 300 and 300 plus lower extremities looking for a VMO. Okay. Like that's how, like, we're just nerding out. Um, but yeah, so I really enjoyed that. My least favorite class was uh, immunology only because I thought that the source material, like the source stuff was so interesting, but we were getting like this just 
flyby of like, yeah, here's all these weird named like receptors and oh, they have funny names, sonic, you know, uh, uh, and SNRPs and toll like receptors. receptors. Yeah. Yeah, And non toll like receptors. And you're like, oh, cool. That's someone's just trolling everyone, but you know, whatever. So that was my least favorite. Uh, what about rotation? So, so for the listeners at home, if you, again, if you don't know anybody who's gone through the medical education process, what happens the first two years in general or preclinical, you're in the classroom, you have some exposure to like standardized patient interviews to try to get you ready for the clinical years, but third and fourth year, you're out of, you're out of class, um, the classroom for the most part, and you're in the hospital doing rotations. Um, what was your favorite rotation that you, uh, that you did? Um, well, so I already, you rotate I already through know what your the, least favorite one is. Yeah. You rotate through all the major specialties. Um, and obviously this, the one that uh, resonated with me and ended up being the specialty I went into was the internal medicine rotation. That wasn't necessarily like the most, you know, entertaining one of them, but it was the one that like cognitively resonated with me. Like this is actually where I'm supposed to be because this is sure. what I'm good at. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but the most entertaining ones were, I did actually two different psychiatry rotations. One was the inpatient psychiatry unit and one was the, uh, psychiatry Psych consult Council. service. And, yeah, yeah. uh, and both of those were, you just, you know, those are where like the best stories come from. Um, the, the most fascinating, you know, things happen on the inpatient psychiatry unit where you have active psychosis and mania, and you can see all the just literally crazy stuff that that happens t to these folks and then our consult psychiatrist was just a very uh, entertaining guy and so we had a good time rotating with him um but yeah those are probably the favorite ones i mean surgery made me want to quit medical school um i actually <laughs> i actually had a meeting with one of our deans during my general surgery rotation um asking what kind of options would be available to somebody who did not want to pursue further training in medicine because i wanted to like leave <laughs> so Jeez, fortunately wow. i got through the rest of that um i think i was doing a mix of general surgery and um uh ent head and neck cancer surgery and and, and that it was just not for me so yeah that's gonna be a no for me dog i think my favorite i had an elective on hand surgery which was just dude I got to do so much. Like I'm pretty sure that I probably shouldn't have been able to do, but, and, and all the procedures, I mean, I did not love my surgical rotation. I mean, I was, I was geeked out on the anatomy, but the actual like program itself was not really. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't really love all that. And then the hours were gnarly. So anyway, I didn't love that, but the micro hand surgery stuff was cool. Like 45 minute cases. You could sit down. <laughs> Great. The least favorite, my least favorite was. Uh, pediatrics just because again the pro the culture it's, the medicine was never the problem it's just the the people yeah yeah <laughs> um okay so now this is the time management portion and we'll wrap up we'll, we'll then we'll get to like some residency stuff but this is kind of inter, inter uh, intertwined so like during medical school how did the question we always get is how do you balance like studying training sleep and like a social life and I, I always kind of laugh at this question because I'm like, I'm not, I don't think that I was balanced. Like, this is like a 10 band equalizer, right? And so for me, training was always turned up to 10. Like it that never, literally never wavered. There were not like periods of time where I was like, oh, I don't want to train. There was periods of time where I felt like, sure like or like, you know, wasn't super psyched to, you know, go do a ton of a ton of training, but I still loved training. I mean, I still love training today. That's, that's one of the reasons why I keep doing it. So that was always at 10. And then everything else kind of was up and down depending on what I needed to do. If I didn't have any impending tests, if I didn't have, if uh, uh, I, I didn't have um, uh, like somewhere I had to be up for early in the morning, well, I wouldn't study as much and I would go, I would be social with my friends, you know, uh, or I would travel. I did a lot of traveling during the first two years, which is an unusual yes. experience <laughs> for medical students. But like, I went to Europe a couple times. I went to travel, do all these seminars. Like I had a ton of fun and I obviously studied and did very well. And training was obviously fine. I mean, I hit my best total of my entire life during my third year of medical school. Um, there were periods of time where I slept less but I didn't, I wasn't actively trying to balance anything other than like being adaptable to the different, different demands. So, but I, I honestly didn't think it was that hard. Yeah. I think that one piece of this discussion in turn, as far as like the historical parts leading up to medical school that I didn't mention was that I was a varsity athlete in college and I was, you know, on the, on the, the swim team at the university where I was. 
And so, you know, we swam to give an app, to give an idea of how much we trained for swimming. There would usually be a one hour swim Monday morning in the afternoon, you would lift for one hour and then you would swim for two on, that was all on Monday. That's like four hours on Monday in the morning on Tuesdays and Thursdays, there'd be an hour and a half swim in the afternoons. Both of those days, there'd be two hour swims. Wednesday, you'd lift and swim. Friday, you'd lift and swim. Saturday morning, there'd be a three hour training session. So that was an enormous amount of train of, of time that I was spending swimming, lifting, running, um, and hanging out with my, my teammates and doing stuff with them that was not available to me to study organic chemistry. Um, and so I had to learn at that stage in the game, how to manage my time very well. And so that definitely meant that sometimes socializing had to take a back seat to, you know, drawing a bunch of hexagons on my, on my paper to, to prepare for a test or something like that. But sure. I, had, I had to learn that early on because I was on already on, on like an accelerated academic track. And I had like 30 hours a week that were just gone, you know, for training that couldn't be used academically. So I would agree that that ended up translating into the first year and uh, oh, first two years of medical school, not being particularly difficult in terms of managing studying and, and training, because once again, I already knew how to study. Um, I already knew how uh, I could learn, absorb and retain the material. And so I was going from, you know, a relatively less uh, rigorous academic environment from just plain undergrad, which was not super, super difficult, but had a ton of time dedicated to swimming and then just kind of flipping the ratios a little bit in the sense that now I had more academic responsibilities, more stuff to learn, more studying to do. But I was training way less. You know, I was going to the gym three or four times a week. If, you know, um, for, you know, anywhere from one to two hours, depending on how much training I had to do, how much time I had, which is, you know, far, it was like less than half of what I was doing from a training standpoint at the college level. Um, and so, yeah, that made, you know, training never, never slowed down, never wavered, was never really much of a challenge. Um, and, and I think it was actually beneficial in terms of keeping my brain engaged in what I had to do rather than like burning out from flipping through pages and studying more. Um, so I think that that was a huge benefit that I had was again, learning how to study and manage my time before going into medical school. If you haven't learned that stuff by the time first year starts, you're going to have a hard time. Yeah. Until you figure it out. Yeah. In which And then things are going to be great. I, again, I thought the first two years of med school, oh, it was great. I, 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 well, again, cause you think I literally never went to class. Right. So I only showed up to mandatory labs. So I had the whole day to do whatever I wanted. And so I would spend time in the morning studying and then I would go train for two to three hours whenever, you know, <laughs> then I would like come back and answer emails or write content for barbell medicine. I mean, I counted there was like 140 something articles published during medical school. In addition to launching this business, in addition to traveling and coaching, in addition to my own training. You know, I, I trained four days a week, two to three hours a time, you know, plus GPP. So I was actually in the gym six days a week. You know, I never missed a training session. And I'm not saying that like, oh, beat my chest. It's just like, it wasn't a problem. And so when I get all these messages, like, what do I do in medical school with my training? I'm like, you just train, like, you're going to be fine. The problem is especially not first, the first two years, the first two years are fine. Like as long as you know how to study, like what works for you, then your time management skills are way up because you're like you don't need to spend eight hours not studying to get mediocre results you could spend two hours of like dedicated you know work and then you're going to get that huge benefit right and then you have or or you, you know maybe you can set it to three hours but then you have all this extra time that you previously were wasting before using inefficient methods um if you don't know how to study then yeah, things are tough but so first two years are not the problem the problem is third and fourth you know third and fourth year mainly third year when your time is not your own anymore yeah. i mean i literally went from not ha i could do whatever i wanted to now i had to be at the hospital usually before six you know and then you only got to go home when they let you go home so <laughs> then i would get home at like you know four or five or if you were on call later six seven i still it was still fine though uh usually because there's a lot of downtime in the hospital as well especially if you're a med student so I was either studying either on my phone or on my computer, or answering emails for barbell medicine, trying to make a trying to make a dollar. <laughs> um, it, and then I, I think the other thing that you and I probably take for granted a little bit is that I did have a gym like in my garage third and fourth year. So it did cut down on the travel to like, I mean, you still had to come over. So it was kind of 
it wasn't as easy, but like for me to drive to like brute strength and come back, that was like an additional 45, 50 minutes. And literally I'm, I'm walking through the gym as I pull up to my home, yeah. you know, like it's hard to like miss. For most of the first, you know, half of med school, I was training at the university gym in town, like separate from our medical school. So I had that travel piece, but again, with the first, you know, the, the schedule, the first couple of years, that wasn't that big of a deal. And then once we met and we were training at your garage, that was pretty sweet. And yes, definitely having a home gym, um, is, is key to adherence in this sort of situation. And that became even more important for me in, in residency for sure. Yeah, I would definitely, I mean, if you're able, if you have a garage in medical school and you're like worried about when, if you can train or not, like I would get a rack and a bar and a bench, you know, that'll, that's definitely worth the money. It's worth you're just think about it. Invest you're investing in yourself. Uh, that being said, if you can't get one in medical school, like I think you're going to be fine on days that you're on call, you know, your long days where you literally cannot make it to the gym because, you know, the gym's going to be closed by the time you would get there. Well, you train the next day. It's fine. As long as, if you get it in during the week, that's fine. You know, uh, that being said, I never had to do that. Just given the way our, our setup, I think, uh, the more, I guess, trying to even more trying than that was residency It's residency. Your responsibilities go way up <laughs> and you're even, and you're in the hospital even more. You don't, you're still studying a lot too, which is the other thing. And I was in LA and I didn't have a gym at my home and I had to deal with LA traffic, not only to get to and from work, but also to get to and from the gym. So the way I de dealt with this is I had four gym memberships in LA because depending on where I was at in the city, I could get to one of these gyms and not fight traffic. That That's what I would do. Uh, I think the only modifications that I ended up making to my training was that some days I would split up my training to where I would do like two lifts on Monday, one lift on Tuesday. And then, you know, like back, like to split up the whole, one training session into two days. And then, and, and so some days I was training six or seven days a week just to like, try to get it all in, but it was fine. Like, I, I don't know, man, like I, I want to be empathetic and I guess I'm empathetic to people who have things that they cannot control that dictate their schedule. You have kids sure. at home, you've got Two jobs family or stuff, whatever. yeah, yeah, family stuff, whatever. Like, yeah, I get that you can't control that. But on the other hand, like I was literally clocking in over 80 hours a week, you know, well, I was clocking in 80 or 79, <laughs> but I was doing over 80 hours, uh, probably closer to a hundred hours, including travel to get to and from my place of business, <laughs> you know, during the week. And I, I still got all my training sessions in and they were not short training sessions either. You had a home gym. If I had a home gym, oh man, I would have been the, the thing that suffered the most during my residency training, like was my sleep because I had to, I still had the, all the emails and all the content and stuff to, to crank out. And it was just harder to sleep as much, but yeah, I mean, an average night of sleep was five to six hours. That's like a re average night in, in residency. And people were like, oh, how did you do that? I'm like, I was cranky, man. Like I got white, I have white in my beard. This is not an accident. No, I mean, I wouldn't recommend doing that unless you have to, but if you have to do that, would you rather have somebody who get, you know, six hours of sleep versus seven and a half hours of sleep and train, or would you rather have them get seven and a half hours of sleep and not train? Uh, yeah. So I would rather them train, but I would rather have, I would rather them train, especially if the sleep restriction is projected to be a short or a, or a limited term issue. In other words, if they're like just living their normal adult life for the rest of their life and they're going to be sleeping sure. like six hours or less a night and they're wanting to train like two hours, four days a week or something like that, then I would work even harder at trying to figure out other ways to modify their life schedule, set them up with a way that they can cut out some of that time to get more sleep sure. or even potentially modify some of their, their training, um, maybe spread it out more or whatever the case is, if it's going to be like for the rest of their life. Cause I think we have enough evidence on, you know, long-term harms of like significant sleep restriction over the course of, you know, a lifetime. But if it's sure. like, you know, you did it for a year, like, uh, okay. Yeah. Especially that it wasn't continuous for a whole year because it would have varied by rotation. You know, you're doing yeah. it for a month at a time. If you flip to a, you know, an outpatient clinic rotation for a month, then, you know, life's back to normal again. It's not a, not a big deal. Um, yeah. so it just depends on what you're having to do. 
Yeah. So I think for most people, if you if your schedule is bonkers or you perceive you think it's going to be bonkers, you're you know, and that's going to affect your training. It's almost like a nocebo. You've just nocebo yourself. Like it's going to be bad. That being said, if you look at it, if you look at things objectively, and you're like, I'm concerned about my time my time restrictions that are impending. And first thing I'd have somebody do is you're going to switch to a three day a week program. Like that's going to be your. So you have nine movements potentially that you're going to do, and and then. I would be okay with splitting that up over seven days. So if, if you can get one or two lifts in on two days and every other day you're doing one lift, whatever you need to do to like st- maintain compliance, right? And then the other, the next modification I would make outside of allowing you to train on more days, if you can, if that makes it easier for you, is uh, the last lift of the day, you can just put, make it uh, a timed effort set. So for instance, if you're working up, to, if you're trying to do like sets of eight, at RP8, like it says, work up to RP8 for eight reps, do three sets. Then what I would have you do is pick what you think to be like a, a, a 12 rep to 20 RM load, and then just do sets of eight with that on abbreviated rest and just try to accumulate as many reps as possible in 10 minutes. It's not optimal, but hey, guess what? Neither is like having compromised training resources and, it, and we're trying to make you get the training effect that's desired while not like, you know, over overreaching your your training resources. So those would be like my main changes that I would do. If you have to train on two days a week, let's say you work crazy hours Monday through Friday and you can only get everything in on Saturday and Sunday. I mean, yeah, it's all better than not training. It's all better than not training. Um, so that being said, <laughs> when people are like, what did you, how did you modify your training in med school uh, or in residency? I was like, I really didn't outside of again, maybe changing like, how many lifts I was doing per day. So some day, some weeks I would train more days, but otherwise. I modified my training pretty radically in medical school because for the first couple of months of medical school, I was doing three day Texas method. And then, uh, you know, that didn't go very well. So then <laughs> after we met, my training changed quite a bit. Yeah. Somebody asked us like, who, you know, who did our programming, like, and whatever. So in med school, you were initially self-coached. You did your linear progression then you did Texas method. Yeah. We must've met, it was before your third year, I guess. We met, we would have met, uh, let's see. No, I would have been, it would have been fall of our second, of my second year. When you started out your first year, we, we would have met that fall. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, when we started training, like when we had our first session oh. together at Brute, that was yeah, probably no, spring. I think it was that fall. Cause I did, we did the spring meet that year, March of 2013 or something like that. I guess it would have been. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you were, yeah. Then you stopped doing Texas method. <laughs> so you're, so I guess, uh, I, I think I wrote most of your programming through medical school yeah. and then yeah sometimes sometimes we ask each other or oftentimes we ask each other for like what to do now (laughs) thoughts yeah to share to share was programming for me all through medical school until the crossfit debacle of 2015 2016 um but yeah i I, it's funny because i never ever i don't even think mike knew that i was in medical school (laughs) like i because i didn't bring it up i was just like send me the programming and it was like four days a week, three, three lifts per day, plus some GPP. And I was like, neat. Yeah. So that, that ended up being fine. Uh, okay. Last question pertaining to actual medical school. How much debt are you in Baraki? Let's, uh, currently let's, zero. Yeah. Ooh, mic drop. <laughs> well, same. I also do not have any med school related debt currently. Uh, I graduated, I paid cash for med school. Well, not like cat. I didn't walk in there with like a duffel bag and it was like, <laughs> make it. I, but the funny thing is I tried to do that. Like I tried to bring in cash initially. They would not take cash. They needed a certified check. So, um, but yeah, so I paid for most of my medical school out of pocket and then um, financially it made sense to actually take loans out for my last uh, two years. But then I paid that. So I'm currently have no debt. I think the average indebtedness is like 180 K yeah. or was a long time ago. Uh, or like when we started our medical training, it's probably I higher had, now. Yeah, I had I had quite a bit um, from medical school. And then I think through uh, uh, living habits as well as working three jobs, um, plus my wife having her own job. So four jobs between my wife and I, um, we have very, very aggressively paid that down um, relatively quickly. So it's fortunate to be able to do that. You're about to get an R8. That's what's happening. <laughs> yeah. I heard I heard they have great engines. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good longevity. Uh all right. So let's uh so well somebody or people were asking about um, 
you know, how old is too old to go into medical school because they're concerned financially. Like, sure. what would you say to somebody Oof. in that regards? I don't know, man. That's a hard that's a hard question. I mean, we had some people in our med school class or in my med school class who were around 40 or so. And um, I mean, I guess that's the, the thing is, is like the more financially independent you are, the less your age would matter if you really want to go into medical school. But again, sure, yeah. the more financially independent you are, the more I would ask like what you're doing. If it's something that yeah. you really want to do, then cool. You can go in, you know, at 65 if you, if you really want to. Sure, um, just but, if, but, if you're, but if you're not and you're anticipating that you're going to come out with, you know, 300K in debt and you're 45, I mean, uh, depending again on what specialty you end up getting into, you may have a hard time with that uh, on the other end. So I think it's just relative to your current financial situation and uh, what your specialty uh, ultimately ends up being, which to an extent may not be within your control if you perform poorly in med school and you, doors close to you. You know what I mean? So there's like a lot of uncertainty there that I would probably be uncomfortable with after a certain point, probably around that 40 or so yeah. age. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I think, you know, you have to look at, you have seven years of training minimum between medical school and residency. Um, before you're getting a, like an adequate paycheck. And I think if we round up to $200,000 of actual of like debt and we assume no additional debt from like a mortgage, no additional debt from like, you know, kids. other loan. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you went, if you went to residency and you had two kids and Oof. you had, you, yeah, well, so you're going to have to take out more, yeah. more than that. So, but let's just say, you know, seven years, 200,000, if you're not planning on having a 25 year career, just an average career where you're not like, oh, and I'm the chair of this and I invented this and I've got all this other side hustle, side money coming in, you know, you're going to be fine. I still I still think you're going to be fine if you're agreeing effectively to work for 25 to 30 years post-grad. Uh, if you're like, I actually only have 15 years to work post-graduation because I'm 40 and I want to go into neurosurge and it's like, you know, that's like a 10 year thing. You're like, I don't know if that makes sense from a financial standpoint. On the other hand, like, if that's the only way that you're going to be able to like live with yourself, then go, go get the psych eval first and then like you can enter <laughs> yeah. into this. Yeah, I think for the for the financial questions, you know, for students who are listening or, or people who are early in residency or med school, whatever this whatever the stage is, um, I would go check out the the white coat investor. Um, he's an ER physician and he yeah. seems to have developed quite a bit of financial savvy for himself. And he puts out a lot of very good educational and practically useful content for people in this scene with respect to student loan, debt reduction, financial management and stuff like that as physicians, like with specific advice for the physician um, in mind. Yep. Yep. I, I, I guess. And then the only thing I'd add to that is I'm just, I wouldn't worry about, Oh man, there's so much debt. Like that's what people will say. Like you tell them that you're a doctor or whatever. And like the, I think the thing automatically just trying to like, you're trying to maybe even cut you down to size. Like, yeah, but I bet you're in like a ton of debt. And I'm like, no, a lot of students definitely, definitely are. Um, and so, you know, for a lot of people, it's a pretty big consideration. But even then, you know, you know, over a certain amount of time just working, you know, they'll be able to get it paid down. So it's doable. Yeah, yeah I just don't think it's a huge deal. All right. So, Baraki, why did you choose your specialty? Um, so my specialty is internal medicine for people who don't know what that is. Basically, it is uh, how do I summarize it? It's adults only, uh, no pregnancy and no, uh, surgery. So, uh, basically it's, can be inpatient, uh, it's primarily inpatient focused, but can be inpatient or outpatient, uh, medically complex, uh, adult, uh, care. Um, and again, we don't deal with pregnancy or perform any surgical procedures. So right now, primary, primarily, um, you know, I'm trained to function in the inpatient setting, take patients from the emergency department and admit them and treat them for whatever, you know, brings them in that needs to be treated in the inpatient setting. Uh, related to various medical conditions. Um, so why did I choose it? Well, going through my rotations as a third year student, um, you know, you're just going through getting experience and seeing which ones I, you identify with or which ones you like. Um, and so, you know, I did, I did medicine like second to last as a third year student. So I had gone through psychiatry and I was like, this is entertaining, but not for me. I did OB. I was like, this is super boring for me. Did surgery, hated it. I did pediatrics and I was like, okay, this is okay, but I don't really like kids. So let me see what this medicine thing is like for adults. And then I hit medicine fifth that year. And, um, pretty much within the first week I was like, 
oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is where my brain works the best. And really, you know, it's the, um, I, I really enjoy the thinking aspect of the field, the uh, obtaining data. Of course, it's a field where you're interacting with patients, it's, whereas others are primarily operating behind the scenes as consultants to other doctors. But this is one where you're interacting with patients, you're obtaining the data, having like, you know, interpersonal interview skills. Um, you are trying to assimilate and synthesize the data in your brain to come up with, you know, differential diagnosis and work through a treatment kind of pathway and, and kind of directing things from that standpoint. And really that kind of cognitive complexity um, I really enjoyed um, learning about both common and rare conditions and, and um, staying up on the research for it is, is really enjoyable to me. And I strongly dislike performing proce procedures um, in general, although there are a handful that I'm trained and that I have to do, you know, on a somewhat regular basis, but I don't love doing them. It's not like my jam. Um, I'd rather solve complex problems and treat them from a cognitive kind of standpoint and, and uh, working with people to work through these issues as we do even in our coaching practice with respect to pain and injury and stuff like that. So all those skills um, are, are pretty enjoyable to me. And I think that's why I ultimately picked it and, you know, narrowed it down pretty quickly compared to the surgical fields or, you know, uh, that, that's probably the first decision that I suggest medical students figure out um, when they're rotating is, uh, do I like procedures or not? Am I going to be a surgeon or not? Medical or surgical is like a pretty early thing that you can try to figure out. And then from there, there are a bunch of other like little sub pathways that you can choose between. Do you like adults or kids, pregnant or not? Do you like to work with patients or not see patients? Um, things like that. Yeah. This is another place where we like differ. Uh, I, I actually really liked ortho. Like I thought that's where I was going to go just because I think it's, it's either the anatomy thing or something has been like conditioned into me. Like, you know, the, I Carp perceive, car human, I would, human carpentry. Yes. Right. Yes. Well, <laughs> and I thought that, you know, maybe, maybe I thought people would like me more if I went ortho or like yeah. people back home would be proud of me. Like, God, he achieved his goal. <laughs> and, you know, ult ultimately my best friend from, uh, uh, and for, and Matt, my master's program went ortho roommate went ortho, like, yeah, people were going ortho around me. So in any event, I, cause I do, and I love the procedures. Like it was all cool. Uh, I just knew that I didn't want to actually practice medicine as of like third year in medical school. Like I knew that's not, wasn't going to be something for me that I wanted to do. And the idea, the reason was, is I knew that I, from, I wanted to do a public be like. In more involved in the public health side of things and like health promotion. And I thought that a medical degree would be helpful for that. The medical skills would also be helpful communicating and, and not, and having that skill set for like as a knowledge and knowledge base that would all be useful for like integrating this information to deliver it to people in more accessible ways. And also to like further be able to communicate with doctors a little bit more on their level versus just being like, Hey, I'm the local trainer. Like let's talk about squats today. So, you know, that's why, you know, we actually get to do, we get to write stuff for up to date or we get to do grand rounds and, uh, you know, it's cool. So, but in any event, I actually really liked ortho. I just knew that I wasn't going to practice and it seemed silly to like go into <laughs> five years of residency. <laughs> yeah. So then I was like, and then I couldn't actually decide otherwise, like, what did I really like? I didn't really dislike anything. I knew that I didn't want to necessarily do any of the other surgical specialties. Again, same same sort of reason, but I couldn't figure out like, do I like kids more than I like adults? Eh. And then I thought family medicine was actually going to be way more relaxed than internal medicine, just from like a time standpoint, because bar because barbell medicine was you know blowing up at the time too, right? So I like I knew that I had a responsibility there. Um, turns out my residency in particular was not as chill. I like that you're shaking. It's like, you know, because you, you were that. I I remember calling you like, again, like I'm on ICU. I'm like, I need your, tell me what to do. Like, is this okay? And you're like, I mean, yeah, you're going to, you Shouldn't might get in trouble for like, not, <laughs> yeah, for not clearing this with your supervisor, but your supervisor is nowhere to be found. So it seems reasonable yeah. based on what you're telling. And I was like, okay. Yeah. You, <laughs> help, you, had a, help, Dad. You, you had a, you had a poor experience for sure. Not the way it should be. Yeah. So ultimately decided to move on and, and uh, get get uh, closer to what we're actually trying to do with barbell medicine. So that, but that's how I ended up in family medicine. I could have easily gone internal medicine. I mean, the reason why my scores were so high was because I thought I want I didn't want to close any doors, and I also wanted to show people, you know, back home, like, see, I'm not the kid with a terrible undergrad GPA. You know, I just didn't know what I was doing. So uh, as far as being a competitive applicant for residency, I think we just briefly. This is like a lot of the similar stuff just morphed f from medical school, like. 
academically, I think you should be, you know, uh, up to snuff. I think your letters of rec are a little bit more important just because people are t- saying not only what your clinical skills are, but like how it is to work with you. Cause effectively you're interviewing for a job position for the next three to five plus years or research and job positions. And so people need to be able to work with you. Uh, the, I guess one quest, one thing I don't have in here. Um, I mean, cause I, we also talk about research and like having extracurriculars. What, what do you think about like the prestigiousness of a certain medical school and how that actually applies to like getting in? Cause my take, my take on it is that that's actually in my experience has not been that important. Um, only because you see people from all sorts of institutions get into what would be considered very competitive residencies. And it's again, the academic pillar is, you know, that, and that box is checked their letters are rec checked you know they have some extracurriculars checked and maybe the extracurriculars and research or whatever makes up for like coming from a lower tier med school but they're all good yeah all the medical schools are great yeah i think that similar to the met to the getting into med school discussion we said you know college scores uh, grades and mcat is one pillar the interview would be another one and letters would be another one i think that translates over really well so grades in med school plus your step one score again is is an, in, like probably the most commonly cited one here, a huge one, uh, letters, either individual letters of recommendation or your school's like Dean's letter that kind of summarizes how you performed on your rotations, um, is the second one. And then, uh, how you interview would be, would be the third big one and same kind of concept to the extent that any of those are less than stellar, you will need to make up for it with other extracurricular activities or research or other things. And not just at this point, it's not just to the extent that any of them are less than stellar. It also depends on what field you're going into. So for me, for example, I had my three, my pillars were all very, very strong. I was not applying to like, you know, a top residency program in the country because I was applying to a place that would get me the training that I wanted and where I'd be able to live with my wife. So that was the, that was kind of the motivating factor there. <laughs> Nerd. <laughs> and then, and then, uh, and, and I was applying to internal medicine, which is not like the most competitive specialty in the world. So I did not have to have, I did no research and I had relatively few extracurriculars outside of what I could say that I had done with barbell medicine or some other like volunteering thing through the school, but like not a ton of it. Um, whereas somebody who either say they're any of those pillars are less than awesome. They have to make up for it with more things, or if you're going into certain highly competitive specialties. So for example, um, like if you want to do radiation oncology, you will not match into that field without research in radiation oncology. If you want to do dermatology, you pretty much have to have research. If you want to do ortho, you pretty much have to have research. Um, and I am not interested in being a primary researcher. And so, you know, Arguably, just that about me in itself, not having an interest or willingness to do research, arguably could have closed those doors to me. But I didn't want to do those fields anyway, so it's fine. Um, But uh, those are the considerations um, in in getting into residency. It's the same thing. As far as which one you choose, that's like a really difficult decision because you don't want to end up in a really malignant place like where Jordan ended up. Um, You want to go to a place that's very positive, good work culture, supportive, uh, good uh, faculty that are responsive to residents' needs and will change things about the program if needed all of which the residency program that I went to met those criteria. They kept their residents very happy, had a good experience. Um, And that's something that you have to really try to suss out when you go for your interview day. All residency programs will give you some like private time with the residents where you can try to pick their brains. Sometimes they might have picked residents who are, they'll probably have picked residents who are like particularly strong or doing well to, you know, and, and they might give you a false sense that things are really great, but you, I mean, yeah, that's part pop- of the game because you have to try to figure out what, what is the culture of this program and is it supportive and, and, and am I going to be happy here, which is again, harder said than done. But, um, I was lucky that I had a very positive experience at, at my program. Yeah. And you suicide matched. You just yes. I only applied place. to one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> again, I was yeah. able to do that because all my, you know, my scores and everything were, were at a, at, at, at a notch where given the prestige of the institution, which is not mass general or something like that, I was like, yeah, I'm going to get in there. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I only ranked the uh, four places, which is uh, pretty low just for, you know, most people rank 10, 15 or whatever, but I, again, strong scores. UCLA is fairly competitive, but it's family, but it's family medicine. So it, do you think that if you wanted to go to mass gen that you would have, you would have had to do. Yeah, probably. Do you think though, if you would went to medical school at like Georgetown, that that's the same deal? Um, I think that makes less of a difference. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I agree. Like uh, what I'm getting at is that I don't think that you could have gone anywhere. I think you could have gone to Harvard HMS, Harvard Medical School itself. And for you to get into their internal medicine residency program with the same scores that you have, unless you had like a, you know, a letter from the internal medicine program sure, sure, director, sure. like yeah. this guy is the stud. Yeah that you would still need research and extracurriculars only because it's hyper competitive. Yeah. So, so what I'm getting at is that the, don't the, sweat the, the specific med school itself. The only exception yeah. would be Caribbean med schools. Yeah. Yeah. Or not, yeah, non, non us or international yeah. stuff that bumps you yeah. down quite a bit and you need to make yeah. up for it with a lot of other things. If you want to do well, um, you know, coming yeah. from a Caribbean medical school, uh, since it's, I feel the same way also from like undergrad to medical school, just like, you know, Oh, you went to this, you know, crazy prestigious school the only um, if it's directly connected to a medical school and like you can get in directly like cool uh also if it's connected to a medical school you might have more opportunities to like go shadow or like meet people for like letters and whatever that's all cool but ultimately it matters way more what your gpa is and further if you if you gave me the option to like graduating from an ivy league undergrad school with seventy five thousand dollars worth of debt versus going to a state school with the same gpa and you know ten thousand dollars worth of debt i'm going to pick the second option yes, like same. don't too. go into medical school with a ton of debt if you can avoid it yeah if you can't avoid it i mean whatever just make more money <laughs> <laughs> it's fine okay doctor's opinions and then we'll wrap this guy up uh, Austin Baraki, what specialties do you think give physicians the most, uh, access to do good? I intentionally left this vague or the asker. Uh, um, so I think that once you have the degree, um, that automatically puts you on a certain level in terms of a platform from which you can do good. Right. Um, I think that the specific specialty beyond that, um, doesn't necessarily have to change that. In other words, like you can do a whole lot of good having the degree, you know, if, if you have it and say you did some family medicine training, say as you did versus if you did like neurosurgical training or something like that. Right. I don't think that that necessarily has a huge impact on your ability to do good. Um, in fact, one could argue that from the neurosurgical side, you may <laughs> really yeah. do more harm uh, sure. by operating on too many spines, but that's a whole separate discussion. Um, dun, dun. So, <laughs> so I think that uh, it's more it's more just what you do outside of medicine, what you're willing to you know do, how, how much you're willing to put yourself out there. Of course, there's going to be an issue of like if you are objectively speaking outside your scope of you know training and practice. Um, then there's going to be some issues associated with that. And so from that standpoint, you can make an argument for more generalist specialties, right? So like you, like a primary care or family medicine, internal medicine, something like that can give you a, so like, you know, if I had gone into radiology or something like that, then when I'm out here giving people a lot of like, you know, clinical advice about how to manage their like symptoms of something, then people would maybe have a little bit more reason to ask me, uh, a, a kind of question that versus a broader, more generalist field. Uh, I have a bigger scope of things that I'm qualified to talk about. And you still notice that when people ask us questions, there are certain things that I like don't advise people on, like a lot of like, you know, primary surgical stuff. I'm like, yeah, I'm not a surgeon. I can't I can't necessarily comment on that. But in terms of like the public health mission kind of thing, if that's what somebody's looking for, um, then really you can do that with almost anything, I think. Yep. Yeah, I agree. I don't have any uh, I don't have much to add to that outside of saying that. I, primary care gives you a big base of training to potentially like be an ex, you know expert in like man, the initial management and even some of the like lo more you know uh, more complicated cases. But it doesn't mean that you're doing more good in the community. You could do, you could do that as a cardiologist. You could do that as a you know rad onc. There's a lot of places to do good, quote unquote. It, you just it just depends on what you want to, what interests you outside of medicine. Yeah. And you can do good within your little scope or your, your own niche. I mean, if you want to look at it strictly from a disease based standpoint, you look at like the top five killers or contributors to morbidity and mortality. You know, you have like high blood pressure, high blood sugar, obesity, smoking, lack of physical activity um, being the top five. But according to the WHO, like any doctor can attack that regardless of their specialty. Nope. Right. <laughs> no, no, no. Only only family med um, is physician burnout suicide a real problem yes it is it is actually dramatically higher incidence than the general population 
Um, so yeah, suicide rate among doctors is much higher than the general population. It's a big problem. Physician burnout is a complex multifactorial, probably bio and psycho and social phenomenon. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, biology, for example, of like, you know, daily stressors and sleep restriction, psych- sure. psychological feelings of, uh, loss of autonomy as administrators grow and insurance industry tells them what they can and can't do position, uh, patients, uh, maybe having unrealistic expectation or demands of them, um, can be another common thing. Social stuff, you know, or lack of social interaction if they're, you know, not doing anything outside of their work or hobbies or things they enjoy, or maybe they're being criticized by, you know, other medical practitioners, other doctors, colleagues, um, et cetera. So there's all kinds of contributors to why doctors burn out. Um, You can look, I think Medscape does an annual survey on this stuff and you can look at rates of burnout. It's an incomplete likely non-representative sample that they draw this from, but physician burnout is a huge problem. I think like ER is one of the top ones. Primary care are close behind in terms of rates of burnout. Um, the the more highly compensated and lower, less you know uh, demanding day-to-day practice specialties tend to be a little lower on that risk, obviously, because that's going to be a correlate there. Um, but it's a huge problem. And, and, and medical students, I think I, I'm trying to remember what the statistic is. They say that, like, you know, we lose an entire medical school class school's class worth of students to suicide. Um, maybe I, don't, I can't remember if it's like per year or per certain amount of time, but it's it's bad. Yeah, yeah it's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, you know, you, you spoke with this about the lack of autonomy and, and like feelings like there's an external locus of control over like what you're doing and maybe purpose, you know, being helpless and there's no purpose. I, that's not unusual in many industries. The biggest problem in medicine that I I find is is there's like the you're constantly butting your head against somebody else who's in control and you have no influence over how they're like either monitoring you or or it's you know directing you and it's weird because like physician led organizations, physician led innovations, physician led, you know, strategies towards improving health outcomes in general do much, much better than non physician led <laughs> innovations in this space. And it's just like this fear that like doctors, oh, if we don't watch them, they're going to they're going to do bad things. It's like, yeah, like, yeah, heal too many patients. Just get, <laughs> you, know, you get too well. Uh, so, I, yeah, the burnout is a huge problem. I mean, I know I dealt with that in residency and the function of my, you know, program and then, you know, other factors going on. But I don't know what the fix is in today's, in our current government, political system, you know, I don't know. I don't know. It's not, it's not going to be that one weird trick to like make doctors have a better time. So Maybe we'll barbell medicine just expand and, you know, whatever. Everybody just to work on the internet. I mean, that's part of the reason why I ended up in academic medicine because I, I, I work in a hospital. I see patients in the hospital. I admit and treat them in the hospital, but I, I'm working with residents and, and doing a lot of teaching, which I enjoy. Um, if my only option coming out of residency was to do private hospital work, um, given the other jobs that I have, um, and the kind of the, the opportunities from an income standpoint to sustain myself um, from that standpoint, I may well have not done that because it would it is not attractive enough to me to go and grind it out week on week off at a private hospital. I'm not interested in it. And that's a huge place where burnout happens. So, you know, I'm fortunate to have some of these other opportunities to where I had an alternative, um, particularly either to not do it or to do it in an academic setting where the pace is slower, have more time, less of that um, autonomy issue. Um, but it's definitely a huge problem. Yeah. You are quite literally doing the Texas method. And it, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. This last question before we say goodbye to people, what are like some important things in either musculoskeletal medicine, exercise or nutrition that med schools or medical training don't adequately cover? Like what would be the number one thing in your opinion? Um, Oh yeah. Off the, off the cuff. I'll let you, I'll let you handle the nutrition one. I'll say that. Sure. With with respect to musculoskeletal stuff and exercise in general, um, I think that there is no system by which medical students receive any actual experience with exercise. In other words, they're not like, you know, there's no like PE class or something like that where they're, where they're, sure. you know, trained in, in exercise and then use that's translated into like teaching them about exercise prescription where there's no reason why there's, there's no reason why they shouldn't be trained in exercise prescription. 
um, because the result of not training them in exercise prescription is that they have no idea of the benefits. They have no idea how to prescribe it. And they're trained to learn all these like bi fearful biomedical diagnoses and potential complications. So there's a ton of hypothetical risk, no understanding of the benefit. We're trained to be risk averse. And so everybody just says, oh, just stop doing that. Stop, stop exercising. Or, you know, I just did a skin biopsy. Don't exercise for three weeks until this thing heals, which is like, you know, stupid. Um, and so I think that there's inadequate training in exercise prescription. And then the other issue is that if you're going to prescribe exercise, you're always going to run into patients who have issues with pain, you know, knee arthritis, back, you know, low back pain, et cetera. And um, basically everything that we talk about with respect to pain, pain management, approaching it, coping with it um, is inadequately addressed. I would say that in our particular medical school, we had a very excellent and forward thinking neuroscience teacher who actually taught us about the biopsychosocial model. Um, however, the two problems were we were being inundated with too much other material and we were too stupid to actually grasp what he was telling us at yeah. the time. And the other problem is that that theme was not infused into any other material that we were given. It was Correct. not a pervasive theme in the whole schooling. It was just in the neuroscience course and then it disappeared. Um, and so that's a, that was a huge problem that resulted in us graduating. And then I come across this topic like years later and I'm like, holy shit, this was like a pretty big deal and we didn't get it the first time it was told to us. So how right. do we make this better? How do we educate people? How do we infuse it into an entire curriculum start to finish would be the goal. Which is, well, yeah, that's why we, our seminars look like they do. Yeah. Now it's just a seminar. It's not a medical education. Yeah. I, I, I agree. There should be like a CPE course, like clinical physical education. It's run throughout the pre, you know, your entire med school career, or like you have to take so many credits of it before you graduate or something. And yeah, you would not only have to like exercise because <laughs> that's probably good but then you would get uh, uh education on how to prescribe it and like certain contraindications or complication yeah that would be interesting from a nutrition side again you go over it a little bit in biochemistry like the cal calorie equivalents and like so reductionist reductionist approach to nutrition which is a problem yes and there's no real obesity training outside of mentioning that it is like either a risk factor or, or a uh, cause of you know a a bunch Everything. of other diseases. <laughs> so I don't necessarily know if there needs to be like a cooking class, but I do think that uh, a nutrition subcomponent to um, most of your clinical education should, should be there just undertones. Like I don't, again, I don't know if necessarily it needs to be a nutrition course, but when we're talking about uh, pathology and pathophys, for instance, like that you can weave that in there after the introduction, the more rigorous introduction in biochemistry. Um, similarly, I also think like part of the standardized patient encounters that we like go through should not only require m modules of exercise recommendation and nutrition recommendations, but that should be not just a one time like sign off. You pass this, you know, this OSCE, like it has to be multiple, like it's there all the time. So that way it's second nature, just like, Hey, and stop smoking. So I think it just needs to be more pervasive. Same thing with the pain. So I guess if we're wrapping it all up, we're saying we need to have more of these topics specifically, and then it needs to be like weaved into everything else that we're going to learn. Uh, all right. So the TLDR studying space repetition, learning TLDR for training, just get it in. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, and study hard. So it, Austin, is there anything else that you'd want to say to somebody who has interest in medical school? Yeah, I think that those themes that we hammered on are, you know, the main things that I would take away. You have to have some exposure to make sure that you're actually, you know, what you're getting yourself into and that you want to do what you think you want to do. And then once you've committed to that, it's going to be grades, letters, interviews along the way and shore those things up as needed with other things to make yourself look better. That's pretty much how I would sum it up. Yeah. And do a I lot agree. of practice questions. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah. I think it's a good takeaway. I would just say if, if you want to be involved in the medical uh, industry, that you should make sure there's a decision that you actually want to go through with first and then um, work harder than you think you need to so that you can do more good in the community. So ultimately, you'll end up uh, hopefully doing the same things that we're doing right now but in your own communities. All right. Thanks everyone for tuning in to the Barbell Medicine podcast and watching on YouTube. If you're there, make sure to hit like, subscribe for all the latest updates and access to the latest content. Head over to iTunes if you could, please, and hit five stars and leave us a review. That would be oh so helpful. Give us some feedback on our podcast. We love hearing from you guys and we'll catch you guys next time. Thanks. See you.